Max, in order to really understand what reality is about, we are now told that Einstein's theory of relativity forces us to think of time and space as part of the same thing that they're together. There's not space and time, which seems so radically different from each other, but there's one thing called space-time. How can we begin to understand that? So if we think of uh, space the traditional way that the ancient Greeks and Euclid did, it was just a boring stage on which events unfolded over time, mm -hmm. right? Whereas what Einstein said in his first special theory of relativity is that you shouldn't think of uh, all these frames one by one as something happening, but you should think of space-time as just the whole videotape. That's how I think of space-time. And uh, the whole story is just in there. And then his second theory, the general theory of relativity, he came up with this even more radical notion that, moreover, space isn't just static, this backdrop on which other things happen, like the electric field moves around and stuff, but space, time is actually a mover and a shaker in the sense that space can shake, you can have these ripples called gravitational waves, which are just ripples in, in the fabric of space-time itself. Space can move away from other parts of space in a stretching, which is what we mean when we say the universe is expanding, and space can curve a little bit, where the curvature turns out to correspond to stuff, matter, and a lot corresponding to black holes, and maybe space can even melt, which is the latest business for the whole string theory landscape. So in other words, I think we've completely transformed our view of space-time as just being the boring static backdrop to being a very active participant in the universe. Now, is space-time something that's continuous, like a sheet of paper? Or could it be the way we think that matter is based on little tiny pieces of quantums? I mean, it, 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 could space be discontinuous space-time? So according to Einstein, space was really continuous. You could zoom in as much as you want and there would still be right. smoothness and you could zoom more. Whereas if you take quantum theory seriously, that cannot be right because when you look on really teeny tiny scales, like 10 to the minus 34 meters, things are fluctuating in a wild and crazy sort of way. And uh, the jury is still out as to exactly what you would see if you could zoom in that much on space-time. Really, to my mind, this is the single most embarrassing question facing physics today, because on one hand, we have this continuous space-time model the theory of general relativity, which is a beautiful success in describing all things big. And at the same time, we have this quantum theory, which is, describes things as particles, discrete in a sense, which is fascin very, very successful for describing the micro world. Mm. And we can't quite get them <laughs> to fit together. And in order to do so, we have to ultimately understand whether space itself is continuous or discrete, whether it's analog or digital yeah. in a sense. And the way to go about that is the search for quantum gravity is the way that people are, are, are talking about it today. What I see is the main challenge here really is that in the past when revolutionary theories came along like quantum physics, there were all these clues from Mother Nature in, in the way of measurements that we had made but couldn't explain. Whereas we have very few clues about mm. quantum gravity really. You have to find an example of a physical system which is both super tiny, so quantum is necessary, and also extremely massive, so that general relativity is needed. So if you can cook up to have an evaporating black hole in your office or in your lab, that would be great. But we haven't quite figured out how to make that yet. And if my colleagues do, I don't want them to make it in the office next to mine either. And, and then the other best, the other good bet is to look at the universe itself when it was very young. Because at some point in the past, it was so tiny, this region, and so dense that quantum gravity would have been necessary. And my guess is that the best clues we're going to be able to extract about quantum gravity to guide this are going to actually come from studying the infant universe. And so that becomes sort of our ultimate atom smasher because we can create in the early universe, not we create, but we can see what was there, the ultimate 
source of power that can that can really smash things together. Exactly, because not only does the early universe smash particles together way, way harder than we've been able to do here on Earth, but this cosmic particle smasher has already been funded and built. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just need to look out at this guy and uh, get we, the data. We won't get into who, who did the funding and who, who, who did the building. <laughs> but let's go back to the, the fundamental question of, of, this, of the unity of space-time because it is so counterintuitive to the way we live our world. It, it, it just doesn't seem to make logical sense to, to our experience. Time is such a different entity. In, in the three dimensions of space, we can move, we can go back and forth. Time, we certainly can seem to move in or control it only in, in, right. in the one direction. And, and yet, in the physics, the only difference between space and time is a minus sign. And uh, <laughs> the way, but I really frankly think that Einstein's view of this is more natural. If I think of, um, a particle in space moving in this direction, which we'll think of as time. Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking of a thing moving, I can think of a spaghetti strand, you know, going in a straight line through space time. Mm -hmm. If I have Earth and the moon orbiting around it, this will make a spiral through space time, kind of like a rotini. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you have a really complicated thing like the solar system, that's a really messy mm -hmm. piece of pasta. But in, in the end, all the information is, of course, encoded just in the geometry of, of these patterns in space-time, hmm. right? So in that sense, if you know what's in space-time, it's like you have the whole videotape of the universe. It's you, all in there. Are you telling me the creator is an Italian cook? <laughs> Maybe so. I mean, I think it's a pretty talented cook. I like, I like what's come up with it. I like the flavor of it. But, but if we take Einstein seriously about space-time, I think it also forces us to rethink death in the sense that when I was a little kid, I thought, it's so horrible. When I die, I'm going to disappear somehow, and there's nothing left. Whereas, uh, of course, if I think of myself as just this pattern in space-time, that's never going to go away, right? My death is just the end of the little spaghetti strand, and my birth was the other end. It's all there, and if I, I, I personally, this sort of works for me, this way of thinking about life, that it re-emphasizes to me that the important thing is the journey itself, you know, not the endpoints of the spaghetti. I know what I'm going to be doing 100 years from now. <laughs> it's going to be very boring, right? But that doesn't in any way take away from the fact that, I mean, this is a fascinating life here. And moreover, it's not that this is ever going to go away. Space-time is the fundamental thing. It's not space that's the fundamental thing. Look, let's talk about that, because do you mean that in, in something more than just a allegorical, metaphoric way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you mean that that piece of space-time that began with your birth and will end with your death yeah. has some r reality to it and a continuing reality? Absolutely. As we I think this whole no feeling that the past just disappears is just an illusion. Because every little piece of our, our conscience as we move along our, along our world line will only remember its past and not its future. But the past is no less important really than, than our future. And uh, I think that gives a certain amount of consolation. That also means, though, that the future now exists in some way. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does exist in some way. Of course, that doesn't mean I can predict the future, and that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to feel like I have less of a free will than I would have otherwise. But philosophically, it, it certainly makes a big difference. And yet, I think... To my mind, there's just no two ways about it. Space-time is the thing which exists. It's not stuff in space which exists. And uh, I'd like you to leave it, that's, that's the way the world is. And this gives you a different sense of your own life because you see your life as something that, once done, doesn't go away. That's right. And in fact, we haven't yet even proven rigorously that backward time tra travel is impossible. If we were and, or one day able to do a wormhole through which I can go back 100 years ago, the thing which seemed like it was the past is this something one actually could go back and, and re-experience. So in a very real way, it's still there. And uh, yeah, I don't think the past is gone. <laughs>